Hi! Welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics. I'm your host, Lucy Steigerwald. I do believe we're on episode 8. I'm tired, I need to bathe, and there's a lot of depressing news in the news today. So I have assembled a lovely and charming and talented panel to discuss all of these things. The most important is, of course, the imminent death of Archie, as in Archie Comics, but we'll save that for last because it's the most important. Um, I have Joe Steigerwald. You know Joe Steigerwald. Um, and we have Michelle Montalvo, who has had some trouble with cameras, but I think she's okay right now. Um, right. We have M.K. Lords, who, I'm going to give her the proper description, which I'm totally reading and I won't pretend I'm not. She is an editor at Bitcoin's uh, Bitcoin Not Bombs, which is an awesome uh, charitable thing. And she writes for other sites, including her own blog, which we'll have her plug later. Um, and she fire dances because I think she's a dirty hippie, but also a libertarian, so that's awesome. And I'm excited to have her. <laughs> and uh, finally, we have uh, my friend Adam Berkeley, who I met in a history class many years ago when he said that he liked taxes. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? But he was mostly trying to piss me off. We've had many fun conversations since that day. So welcome to Adam as well. Thank you. <laughs> he's so casual, he's not even looking at the computer, um, which is fine. OK, uh, I don't know. We're doing, we're, we're, we're doing this live, and we're, doing, we're, we're winging this. So you know, there's just a lot of horrible news. What horrible news should we talk about first? Joe? I'm gonna I'm gonna put this to you as the fake um um ombudsman. I can't even say that word. Um, what do you what do you think we should tackle first here? Well, I, I'd say the big story of today would be the Malaysian another Malaysian airliner going down. Yeah, I'm not gonna fly on that airline. Yeah, it seems. I'm not gonna do that. Even though, even with these crashes and disappearances, the air travel is still ridiculously safe and. All that jazz. I'm sure everyone's going to be freaking out for the next... I'm not freaking out about this in particular, honestly. It's just that I don't like sitting in a chair that's higher than Mount Everest. That kind of weirds me out. You know? Like, it's really high up in the sky. Uh, that's not right. Um, so, yeah, Twitter was full of, of, of like horrible neocons really just hoping that we get to go to war with Russia or somewhere now. Um, and that was creeping me out a lot. Um. That's what I was most concerned with uh, in this whole discussion. Is like, what are the foreign policy implications of this uh, this plane takedown? It's yeah. really tragic, and it's like, well, what's going to happen um, next? It seemed like a lot of people were being really hawkish. Aren't they always though? Yeah. This point, thing. No one really knows, you know, the, with computerized passports. It's unclear whether there are any Americans on board. Um, so I enjoyed Bill O'Reilly talking about why isn't President Obama all over this, and why isn't he home? Call, why isn't he at the White House calling families? But there's no families to call as of yet. So, I mean, it's, well, that's you don't know yet, you know, yeah. and they would know, they generally know. So, you know, especially since this isn't a disappearance. So I think the foreign policy implications are only what the neocons want, will attempt to make of them in terms of, you know, which is like what they always things. attempt. Which is why it. I mean, I, it's like a cliche, of course, with crying wolf, but like, even if I could, you know, theoretically say, okay, somewhere in the world is a justified war, let's pretend, for, um, for the sake of argument, like, the, the hawks of the world will never be able to convince me if that's the case, because they say it every single time about everything. Every and time actually, a tragedy, every time there's, you know, anything... You know, immigrants crossing the border, let's bomb Mexico, you know, <laughs> Russia, oh, it's Ukraine, let's fight both of them. You know, we, nobody knows what's going on. McCain is already, you know, all over the talk show circuit. Just, you know, he just wants to fund some rebels somewhere. <laughs> any rebels somewhere. I think he would have realized that didn't work in Vietnam. He ended up been staying a long time in a Vietnamese prison, but he can't seem to figure that out. <laughs> he, he really can't. Actually, I can't. Do you remember Adam? Did he actually change his mind on torture? Because I remember back in the day he was against it. Um, I think he I, did. I think he uh, did. you know, 
they decided that it was worth the possible saving of American lives, Ella Jack Bauer. So, you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Jack <laughs> Bauer, our doctrine. And it changed his mind. <laughs> One episode. Uh, think, like, this uh, is great TV. <laughs> yeah. Zero Dark Thirty, he was like, see, it worked. <laughs> oh, God. He just wants to intervene. Like, I don't. I don't understand these people, and it's driving me crazy all day. I was talking to one of my antiwar.com people today about this, and just like, I don't know how to write about war because the people who are for it in the most just 24-7 neocon insane way, like they don't respond to any arguments against it. They believe that they can always know what the end result of an intervention will be, the way that like a liberal tends to think they can predict the consequence of legislation, or, you know, usually economic, but any other kind. Like, they believe that they can scientifically know that they'll know what happens if they intervene somewhere. And if you try to tell them that you can't know for certain, there's going to be some unforeseen consequences because people aren't robots and the world is not, you know, is not actually a, a game of risk. And they don't care about innocent people that much, or they sure don't act like it. So, like, like I, I write for AntiWar.com every week, and I'm like, I don't really know how to write about war at all. I mean, everyone wants democracy, right? Uh. That's, that's what it comes to. I mean, I'm being sarcastic, clearly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, they're doctrinally required to feel like everyone wants democracy, even if we have to jam it down their throat. Like, if they just would just open their jaws wider and take it, then they would see they would be happier. Yeah, and that's, I mean, but even talking about it in those terms, you have to talk about it like it's one person who just needs to take the democracy. And obviously, countries with millions of people are not like that. And that, that's, that's another thing. They always, self-defense arguments, they always talk about it, you know, the one-on-one -on -one metaphor, like, what if he came into your house and assaulted you or your wife? What would you do? Would you just lie down and take it? Like, the, well, they're like the biggest conspiracy theorists of all time, like these neocons. I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous, like the scenarios that they sometimes come up with to justify these things. Like, these are very unrealistic. I mean, there hasn't been a war that's been fought on U.S. soil in, I mean, it, it's been forever now, and it's very unlikely to happen in the future. So, I mean, it's very strange the kind of conspiracy theorist mindset some of these neocons have. Like, there's these boogeymen in every corner, and every, you know, any country can attack us. Like, North Korea, for example, they were making a big deal about North Korea for a long time, and it's like, the, like, do you know how bad the situation actually is in North Korea? I mean, it's ridiculous. I, they're in no, they're in no shape to attack someone, especially as far away as the U.S. Like it was a completely unrealistic threat. But they yeah. don't listen to facts. Like it's, they're not operating on facts and data and things like that. I mean, I want to know what they want because it's easy to 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 say like, well, they want to go to war with, excuse me, everywhere. And they, I mean, don't they have to at least know you can't go to war with everywhere? in the world? Like, there's, there's got to be some sort of, I don't know. <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question? I don't know. It, 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 it derailed. The rant derailed. It fell off the tracks. Um, well, and, you know, of course, there's always, like, the never-waving support for Israel, too. It's like... Yeah. Anyone who's, you know, they in, invaded what, Gaza today, I believe. Yes, they did. They did a ground invasion. That's another lovely story that I'm sure will not result in any civilian casualties at all. No, well, not any important ones, so it's fine. I mean, that's that's the that's that's the thing with them. They 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 don't believe in blowback. And yet that they, they, they're convinced that the world is full of people who want to kill as many Americans as possible. Um, and to some extent, there are people who want to do that certainly. Terrorism is an entirely imaginary. 9/11 was was a big deal. Like I can grant that. If you were, you know, in New York City, it was probably an even bigger deal. Like that's that's fine. You know, I'll I'll, I'll grant you that. But they can't comprehend the most basic principle of like, okay, America or Israel did something, and this population's mad, and maybe they're gonna do something violent, and you know. To, to try to comprehend the motivation is not to say that violence is acceptable. It's like, 
I just feel like Ron Paul in that one debate in 2012 where he basically started to get like really cranky and was all, you know, I tried to, to, to talk about moral objections to war with you fuckers and like, and, you know, you didn't take it. So like, like, fiscal didn't take, you know. Like, I need to find the, the one Ron Paul that I'm thinking of because it's so, I feel it, it's my spirit animal right now because if moral doesn't work, fiscal obviously doesn't work if, if you're into empire building. Blowback isn't real, but America is under siege. Like, nothing America or Israel does, you know, can, it can piss off anyone else in any justified way. It, <sighs> it's, it's the same perversion that kind of, you know, takes over brains of liberals when they try to introduce legislation where they feel like they can control every little aspect and they have every, you know, causality mapped out. And that, you know, the, the Republicans have the same thing with war, where they think they can, you know, you know, move pieces on a chessboard or a risk board, like you said, and they'll know every possible scenario that happens. And, you know, the ones that do happen, like in Iraq, they had, you know, no planning for it all because it never occurred to them. You know, they, they think they can just implement this plan and everything will just go directly according to plan because they're America and they're, you know, bigger and stronger than everyone else. And there's a complete disregard of history and you know, it's just it's the same thing and just in a different you know realm they also no adam were you gonna say something yeah i was gonna say just to um, to, to joe's point neocons seem to view history as something to be changed or broken instead of something that is guides them in the sense of like they're like well the british failed in iraq but we can remake iraq mm -hmm. or you know it's just this. There's just this sort of sense that, like, America, if we spend this much money on defense, surely we can remake the world in whatever image provides us the most oil and treasure. Um, you know, I think that that it does ultimately come down, in many senses, to an attempt to secure uh, American economic economic dominance. Um, yeah. Whatever they cloak it in, it really comes down to we're just we need to control resources and. Uh, because it, and I do think there's some sense of the America needs to have its its empire. Uh, yeah, the the empire of the good guys. I mean, I've I've talked to conservatives, some of whom are even uh, libertarian sympathetic, like this Brit um, who writes for National Review, uh, Charles Cook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was very disappointed when he seemed like like the most reasonable man to ever be employed at National Review, that he had the exact same ideas about what America in the world should look like. And there's this idea of the benevolent empire. And that, well, they, they speak of it also as if, like, it's all about preventative power. Like, America is at home all big and tough. And that, you know, the existence of a, a big big army is enough to keep everyone else in line. And they speak of it as if they haven't intervened incessantly, America. And that's the same with, um, there was a William Crystal article from a couple months ago that my friend Andrew Carell tore to pieces beautifully. And he, he was writing as if there had been no intervention since World War One, and all the, it was all those damn war poets really soured people on war. Like, he, he literally, you know, didn't mention World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and all, you know, the zillions of small-scale interventions. It's like, it's never enough for them. And again, if there was a justifiable war somehow, I wouldn't be able to find it the way they talk about it, because every single one is, we've got to do it, Munich, etc. I think you see really quickly, like even after 9-11, and we're now 13 years, at, or just under 13 years after, but you still see that because of the vast distance between us and pretty much any antagonists, uh, it's pretty. They pretty quickly forget, like, you know, that there is blowback, and even if they don't, they don't believe blowback in the first place. But, but this, you know, it becomes very easy to have the long arm of America when you really aren't at any risk. Yeah. That's one of the reasons you see European countries being unwilling to intervene because they still remember the 70s and 80s when it was dangerous in certain what we now consider very safe capital cities mm -hmm. to sit down at a cafe or go into a movie theater. And we've, we've never, we, okay, we had 9-11, we had uh, Oklahoma City, uh, but we've never really had that, that fear of just, like, I can't go out in public. And even Boston, that was still targeted at a large event, we've never had this just, if I go to the movies tonight, am I coming home? 
Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very easy to forget how dangerous the world is for people who are connected by land or, or even with short distances by air to places that are pretty unstable. And then we feel we can go in and stabilize those areas. Yeah, and one of the best resources I always point people to if I'm having a discussion about foreign policy or... Uh, Nah. No. We'll never know. We'll never know what that resource was. That's the thing. If you go to the primary resources and go through those and stuff, you got to go through layers. But but yeah, so it's Wikipedia. So I understand. I I you know I'm a writer. I don't I don't like to rely on Wikipedia. All that. But disclaimer aside, there is a per there's this great page that shows all of the coups and all the interventions that the U.S. has gone through it through through all of the wars, but even past that, all of the all of the coups. I mean, like in Guatemala and Dominican Republic, and it, all all through uh, you know South America. And it's really great to show these people who are denying or even maybe avoiding the topic entirely, like a lot of. Uh, these liberals and, and neocons tend to do about intervention, and we look around the rest of the world and why they're so afraid sometimes. Oh, why why there's still that uh, uncertainty and that fear in the populations of these different countries? Well, U.S. foreign policy has had a huge hand in that. I mean, it's it's very much influenced the scene, and it's very it's made a lot of people, uh, you know, very afraid and, and unable to go to you know just live regular lives. Um, so and, and yeah, it, obviously, I don't think all of the incidents are there on Wikipedia. It's definitely an incomplete resource, but it's enough of a list to make someone just kind of question and be like, "Whoa, wait a second! This is mm -hmm. this is quite a lengthy list of things here that I didn't really know about because they're not teaching you that in history or yeah, you know, where where you should actually be learning about all of these other interventions aside from the major wars." Well, Ukraine is an excellent example of a kind of soft power intervention, American intervention. Um, which it goes awry. My, one of the things I always point to is El Salvador in the 80s. If you look at that country now, and all the time spent by the CIA and special operations forces in El Salvador in the 80s, it's just that country is a disaster, not just because of our prison system and releasing those inmates, but also because of all the garbage that we forced on that country and all the kind of you know, counterinsurgency operations that we you know, engaged in there as well. So, Absolutely. This idea that, you know, to understand, um, I think there's this idea that these people in foreign countries are so foreign that, that you know, they must only be mad because Muhammad told them to in the Middle East, or Karl Marx told them to in Latin America, or, or you know, or what have you, instead of, yeah, we don't, you know, necessarily subscribe to that ideology or even recommend it. But it's full, these countries are full of human beings who might become resentful, you know, if the CIA stages a coup or, um, you know, there's, there's, there's carpet bombing or a couple of missiles here and there or a constant drone presence just enough to make you psychologically freak out a bit. And I think that the, the, the warmongering, right, they don't, they don't, I don't think they consciously think these people like are not human beings, but they don't think they have the same type of human response that they would have if someone did that to them in their homes. Which again, good old Ron Paul, you know, I, I became a Ron Paul freak too late. Um, he tried to impart this most basic lesson in empathy, especially in 2012 when he was running for president. You know, not anything grand, just we would be mad if, for example, China started bombing us. Or like, as I like to put it, you know, what if Amsterdam started bombing our, you know, DC because our drug war was so oh, fucking please. evil. Please, like, please. I'd be like, that's a great point, but I sure wish you guys would stop that. All right, not DC, but somewhere I actually get Well, that. I'm outside of DC. I'll be good to go. But, <laughs> yeah. But, well, yeah, you're totally right. It's less ideology and more just a rational reaction to our foreign policy. Like, but the American propaganda machine has to say that it's ideology. Because if you can convince people that these people over there are so much different from us that, you know, we can't, you know, they can't possibly believe what we believe. They just can't see how great America is because they're not in it like we are. You know, they're they're communists they're being or they're, by it. Yeah, yeah, they're they're being bombed by it. They're getting the direct result of uh, you know, what whatever you call this. American system. ingenuity. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Something nice like imperialism that. there for you. So you know, we're great at making stuff to kill people, so mm -hmm. 
I always think, actually, going back to the point about ideology, um, from the very limited uh, people I've talked to and also the ridiculous amount of reading I've done, one of the scariest <laughs> things about the public ideology in terms of, like, oh, this is what these people think, is privately, especially in the CIA, they're particularly, they're extremely like, this is what we're doing, we're doing it because of this, and the reasons are not are nothing more than we want to manipulate the power in that country. Really? They're, they're, they're they don't open. tell themselves something nobler no. than that? They're very open in being like, we need to control these countries for this reason, and it really has nothing to do with that they're communist or, you know, so it's, it's actually even scarier in a way. I don't know if it's scarier, but it's certainly um, enlightening, I guess. I mean, it depends. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you prefer, like, naive, like, John F. Kennedy, Vietnam, or do you prefer, like, you know, Noriega's our CIA goon. Oh, he's getting inconvenient. Let's take him out. Uh, uh, I mean, the end result is so often the same. I, I, sure. I, I'm curious about motivations, but I don't know that they change all that much at the end of the day, and that's sort of the worst part. Which is also something I... I argue when you know, really, are you gonna are you gonna feel better because you know your family got killed by Americans in Iraq who were trying you know who had these professed noble goals? Would that make me feel better? You know, if Amsterdam bombed and killed a couple of my family members and they were doing it because the drug war is a humanitarian nightmare, would I feel any better? I don't well, know. I don't think so. It's certainly not the point. No, I'm trying no to definitely make. not. You know, it's not that you feel better one way or the other. It's just no, I know. I realized that. I was trying to really go off of like that. People to talk about how these guys blunder around with their ideologies, but a lot of times it's not even – they literally just, like, we're going to stick our fingers in that pie because we came in. Well, Adam, do you think cool. that people think that they're – that they are that they have nobler ambitions than that? Do you think, think people just – I think – I think when you talk about someone like – you talk about, like – Wars initiated, initiated well, the wars initiated by the executive branch, say like Iraq, even Afghanistan to some extent, certainly Vietnam, you have these very noble ideas. I think typically when you see these like, brush fire interventions, kind of uh, like CIA special activity stuff, whereas these people are, it's a very much a calculated idea and, and there's not any noble thing going on there, just generally like, we need to control this for X reason. Yeah. 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 I, I'm. I started reading uh, Dirty Wars, um, which is really good. I mean, very, very thorough research. I it's very good, and it's very eye-opening because he's talking about, you know, right after 9-11, uh, you know, the first part is all, you know, Bush administration stuff. He's talking about Rumsfeld and Cheney, and these are people who were wanting to go into Iraq since the 70s. I mean, yeah. like, they came back into the political scene, and members of Congress were like, oh, my God, you brought these psychos back in. We have to deal with these psychos. Like, this was the language Congress members were using to describe Rumsfeld and Cheney and some of the other people that were in Bush's cabinet, and they wow. were worried even before 9-11 that these people would try to push us into war. I mean, they really had it planned out for, I mean, decades, and that's really scary to think about. It's, it's really uncomfortable to think about, uh, too, but, I mean, it, it really goes far back, and I don't know that uh, someone like Rumsfeld had that whole uh, kind of moral trip about it. Like, I don't know that it was even rooted in a kind of, oh, well, you know, we need to help people or we need to try to find some moral justification. He was pretty much just like, no, we need to go in there and take over. We need to, you know, mess their stuff up. Like, it was just, uh, it was very eye-opening. I haven't made it through the whole thing. It's it's a massive book, but it's so well-researched, and I, I really recommend it. Um, if you want to really understand kind of foreign policy, going all the way back, though. I mean, this goes he goes like pre-Bush administration, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very thorough. Um, it's a miracle we didn't invade excellent. Iran, too, after what uh, Cheney was telling the Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs bankers that that was the original plan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been, they've been hankering for that for a couple of years, and they've never, uh, never gotten to it. So. I've never heard it being actually admitted until... Like, I always thought that was kind of like a, a liberal fantasy or whatever. Of, well, know. when, I mean, listening to MK talk, there's, like, I don't know, like, the, during the Bush administration, I felt much stronger tie to liberal friends because I was like, wow, you are right. Our president is a piece of shit. Like, yes. I kind of wanted him to privatize Social Security, but that's literally all, you know. And actually, he was weirdly okay on immigration, which is strange. But, like, 
you know, you could just sit back, you could go to your punk shows, and you could rock against Bush, and it was so easy back then. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. I, well, that is where I got into, like, <laughs> politics and got into, like, that was my, I hated Bush so much that, like, I thought I was a leftist, you know? Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I was just like, yeah, man, fuck Bush, and, like, like you said, listen to punk music and just, like, get the rage out and stuff. And, uh, and yeah, like, I, I ended up finding out about Ron Paul and stuff, and that definitely, and just learning about economics and in general, just uh, my limited understanding of it really kind of opened my eyes to like, uh, you know, the social issue stuff is good, but but it's even sadder than that, that's what got me into anti-war activism, and after Obama got elected, that just completely disappeared, and that was like a huge part of, you know, what I believed in, like anti-war, no matter who it is, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, Republican or Democrat, and it was really depressing to see that, that uh, section just completely die out and become complacent and just, you know, whatever Obama does, like, it's whatever... I mean, that's the thing. I'm not going to pretend that all libertarians are, are pure and good, but generally speaking, the idea is to not be immediately shift and start making excuses because your guy is only in power because our guy is never in power, which, you know, it is yeah. like the luxury of never having to compromise in that way. But, um, you know, the, the li often like the salon liberals of the world act as if that's like fun and it's not that much fun <laughs> the scariest thing yeah. for me was how just like with the neocons with bush where they're going well you don't know my favorite thing is when you criticize foreign policy or military operations inevitably someone brings out the well you don't know what they know so you can't make a judgment right right and immediately yeah. the anti-war people with, with obama he's like i'm going to close guantanamo it's like and pretty much everyone is like it's a good idea we should get rid of this extra legal prison it's a good idea but Immediately he's like, oh, I don't know. He doesn't do it. He ups stuff in Iraq. He ups stuff in uh, Afghanistan. And people are going, well, you don't know what he knows. You haven't seen what he's seen. <laughs> well, that's very convenient. But I can also see that it's a huge waste of money, time, and effort, and people. Mm -hmm. So I don't really need to see his classified intelligence in daily brief to know it's a stupid idea. But you can't, I mean, you, you can't, can't disprove that fully. It's, it's a wonderful yeah. argument for them. Yeah, but they're not working off of like a moral argument, which I mean, it's it's pretty obvious that killing an innocent child in another country is wrong. It doesn't matter who it is. I thought it was. Are, <laughs> you know, like it's obvious. just like basic, like you know, human decency, like morality. Yeah, you that. know, <laughs> fuck <Yeah>. that. Like, <laughs> I don't. I mean, that's why like you know, libertarians have these sort of wanky arguments about the the preg like the preg egalitarianism. You mean? Moral arguments, practical arguments, and I think uh, a lot of practical arguments it also does apply because, okay. you know, the knowledge problem of nothing else. But I do think there is a downside. Purely practical, you can mold that. I mean, you can mold morals. You can have the worst moral principles in the world, I suppose. But you can also mold practical into, well, it's, you know, it's a defensive war. We've got to do this. And, well, they, you know... You know, Israel uh, has to defend itself, and it's, you know, so those children being dead is not at all their fault. It's only Hamas's fault. And I don't subscribe to this idea that because someone else is behaving poorly, you know, when your weapons kill, like, a child, I don't know, I, Hiroshima, Dresden, there's a lots of good guys, supposed good guys doing this. And there's a whole type of argument that says it is entirely the fault of the, I mean, maybe it is entirely the fault of, you know, Japan and Hitler and all these other people, but does that end the conversation about what you, the good guys, did? Apparently it does to them. Like, it, just, it, it ends the conversation, and it, it that's very yeah, upsetting. always just by the means for them. I mean, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as, you know, you're the, you're the winner, you're the champion. Well, you're the good guys, and I've asked a lot of you know, neocons and, and right, more right-wing people, and just how bad can the good guys be before they're not the good guys anymore? I'm not sure the answer, but I seriously want to know this. And they don't, they don't, they just, some of them legitimately just say whatever the U.S. does is fine. It's, it's three nukes, Lucy. Three nukes is the answer. Okay. <laughs> That's why we stopped it, too. Um, what did you say? Well, I was going to say, what's the yield on those nukes? <laughs> But uh, the two things, one thing, I, one thing is I, I've always actually liked about libertarians is that you do talk about war, or 
you know, with a moral dimension. I'm so used to talking about it in a practical way that actually moral considerations rarely come up. That's a little troubling. But it's very troubling. I find it troubling personally, even though even as I don't always talk about the moral considerations. Um, the other thing that's interesting is what you're talking about with the um, is how back in the bad guys be. Well, it appears and again. This is just you know sources people I talk to that there's about to be a lot of good guys being bad coming out. Um, it's going to be a real mess. I know I've mentioned this to you, Lucy, but. Uh, you know, it looks like the most elite units have some serious issues on the discipline and massacre in front, and uh, you know, so that's going to be a real disaster. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's going to be a PR disaster. It's definitely probably not enough of one. Uh, though, I would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it going to be enough of a PR disaster if I things mean, come up? As far from what I understand, Special Operations Command has been hiding this. Uh, it's uh, it's still Team Six. They've been hiding it. It's the Naval Special Warfare has been hiding it for years. Um, so I think it's going to be a pretty big disaster, given how President Obama decided that everyone should know that it was SEAL Team Six uh, right. with Bin Laden. So you know, it's 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 pretty ugly, pretty damaging to recruiting when you find out that they've been you know just executing everyone on target. Uh, so is this likely to come out? I mean, this is just people is that you've major spoken to. Newspapers are working on these stories, and uh, they're getting a lot of pressure from Special Operations Command to not publish them. Ah, uh, uh, they should send it to me. I won't give a shit. There is a recent article, uh, actually, on this this uh, website, SoftRep, which I follow, talking about why Bin Laden's body or photos of it have never been released. Oh, I get so Alex Jones about that. Go on. Apparently, they every t every member of the assault team emptied their magazine into his body. Um, so they were like, "Well, it's probably not a good idea to show pictures or his body." So I definitely uh, buy that. Yeah. I mean, that's... And then there's, there's varying rumors about whether or not the body is still in the possession of the government or whether it was actually buried at sea. So. Seems like a very American thing to do. To <laughs> off your very magazines much. And also, there was like fifty or sixty thousand dollars that disappeared, and, and actually some of those seals were killed in helicopter accidents. So that yeah, I heard about that. Resolved yeah. itself, yeah. Um, I, I'm getting the conspiracy theories. I believe crinkle on the spine right now, and I don't like that feeling because it feels very like. I mean, there's no oh, doubt that there's a culture of, like, a rampant culture of egotism and, like, uh, I would say larceny in, in the SEAL teams. Um, so I think that, that we'll definitely, hopefully, we'll find out about this stuff. I mean, Skagel's hinted at it a few times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they, they're, they, like, they always joke that the coolest things in the Navy are the airplanes and the SEALs, and so they do everything they can to keep that stuff quiet. Mm-hmm. Well, those are the biggest lies, really, when it comes down to. Those are really the biggest lies, so I, I really don't put anything past it. I, like you said, Lucy, I go a little Alex Jones on some of that, too. It's, I mean, I, I, I don't put anything past it. I mean, competence. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't believe, right. you know. I, I, I don't believe juice boxes are turning kids gay or anything like that. That's some, like, I, some, I forget what that was. That, was that an Alex Jones that thing? That was an Alex Jones thing, yeah. I mean, there's enough nasty yeah. stuff in Food science that you don't need. You don't need that conspiracy. There's already bad stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, for real. Well, my, my new conspiracy theory that I forget. I don't know if it was a crack list or something where um, uh, Bill Hicks is actually Alex Jones. Oh, I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, hmm, I like it. I don't know. I'm gonna pretend to believe this starting if now. Only Alex Jones is that funny. Yeah, right. Every once in That's a while. That's what gives him away. He's just not as funny. He's funny on accident instead of on purpose. But when he was, okay, but his rant about Justin Bieber and Magellan is amazing. <laughs> it's so funny. I haven't seen that one. Well, so speaking of conspiracy, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's just actually talk about this. Uh, okay. <laughs> this Malaysian Airlines. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I love how the... <laughs> The American government says "blown out of the sky." I'm like that's that's classy. I'm glad you guys could communicate so properly about the deaths of 290 some people. Yeah, that's what we're known for. Yeah, we're we are classy. I mean, I just that I assume that just don't presume to know what happened, to anyone, because you so don't know what happened. That's all I ask. That's that's the best part about Twitter, just seeing all. <laughs> the crazy accusations just immediately like mm -hmm. people the the one I forget what it was like the separatist general like the fake they figured out it's fake but you know by the time some people figure out it's fake like half of the rest of Twitter is still retweeting it yeah and it's just like well, 
I don't I don't understand. Like, there's literally no restraint because I mean, I guess it, it does it doesn't pay. You, you know, you're trying to be the first person to get the real story, so you just you know you hit everything until eventually you come across the right actual piece of information. But nobody knows, and nobody's gonna know because there's so much disinformation. I mean, Russia's gonna blame Ukraine. Ukraine's gonna blame Russia or the separatists, and it's just you know this is is probably not gonna be like the flight. The disappeared, but you know this will probably be a while before we actually figure out what happened. Yeah, and I, I wrote an article about this for kind of my personal blog. I think it, it was after the Boston bombings about how you know just take your time before you form an opinion about a lot of this stuff. And it it was just kind of amazing how quickly everyone just seemed to know the answer. And uh, there aren't answers immediately. Um, and it's good to just kind of wait. And you know, I, I think the responsible thing to do is just kind of you know, shut your mouth about it until you find out the details. If if any come up, I, it's even hard to tell. Even in the first media reports that usually come out about any kind of tragic event, there's misreporting and all that. People immediately jump to conclusions um, on that. So, yeah, that, I totally agree. Just kind of waiting it out and seeing what actually can be reported on. And especially in this situation, it's just there's no telling. It's... I think it's interesting in revealing, uh, you know, U.S. officials, as they say, being pretty certain that it was a service-to-air missile. Um, I think it's very telling about the types of assets that we are, you know, engaging in that area. Um, you know, but uh, so I mean, I, that's as far as I get. I mean, I do believe that the aircraft was uh, shot down, but as far as who pulled the trigger on that missile, I don't think anyone has any idea. We may never have any idea. I mean, they they have no idea what they could have been a plane. It could have been like a mobile, medium range missile system. Um, I mean, it could have been a bomb. Nobody really knows. I've just looked on Twitter, and now people are saying that, you know, the U Ukrainian air force was escorting the plane for three minutes or something. And you know, maybe, but you know, all of this stuff. You know, tomorrow there'll be a whole new slew of things that people didn't know and you know everyone's opinion will change and they'll just keep going like this forever and ever until someone you know actually takes responsibility or you know finds the black box and the rebels well, the, the Russians claim that they've been given the black box but they would claim that so you know, but they they say that it's being taken to Moscow for examination so that is will certainly oh, well, be interesting I'm because... sure they'll, they'll tell us as soon as possible I, I actually think <laughs> that it was the Ukrainians are probably ransoming the black box because uh, they've been complaining about not getting enough support from the Russians. So I'm sure that they'll try to monetize that if possible. Yeah. Well, we seem to have lost Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, anyway, yeah. Uh, I don't know if she can even come back, but I mean, I guess, I guess we've kind of covered the MH Malaysian Air thing enough and went off on a nice tangent about war and Neocons. So probably <laughs> it's time to get to Archie. If anyone has any, uh, you know, thoughts on Archie and the female Thor and any other comic books. Yeah. Female Thor is great as long as it depends on how it's drawn. Um, you know, there's always the issue with female bodies in comics, and they'll they kind of take take give with one hand and take with the other. They'll say, look, female character, strong female character. Look at her breasts. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's comic books in general. It's all, well, like, exaggerated. Like, like yeah. no one looks like Thor, like the male version of right. Thor either, right. like with the giant ripped muscles. Like, it's a totally unrealistic standard because it's that's a cartoon. True, but I think that, like, if someone, if I was not really aware of this, but since my wife is a comic book artist, I've become aware that, like, that's something that we have to kind of fight, we have to kind of fight within the industry because people use that kind of, that argument, you know, well, it's exaggerated, yeah, but the problem is, so yeah, Thor is fine, because Thor is, you know, not human, but, like, what about the next human character? We then kind of move the goalposts to a kind of ridiculous place. That's all I'm uh, kind of thinking about. I've always noticed that, I mean, some like Batman, for example, there's a varying degrees of how he's portrayed, but uh, sometimes he's super beefed up looking. Also an like, issue you in know. comics. That's a growing issue, actually, is the whole, actually, there's male body issues from yeah. Which is no one ever that, talks yeah. about the male physique, then you know, how am I supposed to live up to that? And how are all males supposed to live up to that? Yeah. 
still... Yeah, I, I guess I can't get, like, so stressed out about it. But I, I can see your point, though. Like, I could totally understand. I think it's good to have realistic standards, you know, especially if kids are reading in, they're looking up to those characters. But I, I don't know. Like, with comic books, I don't know that it's as... Um, I, I don't know that, at least I didn't when I was a kid, when I would read comic books and stuff, like, I didn't look to those characters as, like, ideals as far as body. More, It was more of, like, a philosophic kind of thing. I was like, like, like I liked Storm in the X-Men. I thought she was such a badass, you know, not really because of how she looked, but more of, like, how her powers and stuff like that. I think you do kind of have to be worried about kids looking up to real people, though, and having kind of unrealistic body standards with that, but I mean, how enforceable is some of this? I mean, I, I can't say that, like, I don't know, I guess I don't think it's as big of an issue, but I... I mean, I'd rather have a conversation about it, and uh, I feel like sometimes the conversation is avoided because people just say, oh, it's comic books, and, uh, yeah. you know, so that's just my... I'm definitely not looking for anyone to enforce any standards on artists, but uh, I think it's the conversation that needs to happen. You know, I don't think it always does. Yeah. So what are we talking about? <laughs> about oh, let's talk about Lucy, Lucy Steigerwald. Our head. My computer crashed. Yeah. That's all right, Lucy. Oh. I took over, I took over the show. Oh, well, Joe. Get her back fast. Sorry, you had to do that. <laughs> no, we, we moved on to talking about Thor. Thorina. I literally checked and, to see if it was live, and all I heard was Adam talking about something about breasts, and I was like, "Oh, it's still live. Good." <laughs> we went wildly God. off topic. Things got out of control. Or <laughs> thank, thank God for that. So with Archie, so I had this thought, and this may be crazy, but my first thought when I heard about it was, was, are we trying to legitimize the gay friend by making him a member of government, and does that somehow? Like, is that somehow an attempt to make it okay in people's eyes that Archie is defending his gay friend? Why does it have to be that he's, like, is he a mayor or the governor or the senator or something? Why can't he just be his gay friend? Why does it Wait, have to have this government the, the gay friend, The gay friend's a politician? Yes. I missed oh, it. Oh, I missed that, too. Oh, that's no good. That's a really good point. Uh, oh, um, yes. The politician, the gay politician also wants to, he's um, anti-gun, so it's like, all the oh. days that you can possibly fit in the one. Oh yeah! Player. Oh no, I didn't remember saying that. Yeah. Oh, like a gay oh. Brady guy, but like, oh, that's. I mean, it's just. Dude, it's... comics. Not. I. I promise not to offend anyone married to any comic book artist. Comics are totally equal to literature, but Archie is not literature. I mean, it, <laughs> it comes down to. And it's because literature one... doesn't have this kind of ham-fistedness most of the time. I mean, it's, bad literature does. Bad books do, but this is... It's only, it's only one Archie, too, in the multiverse of Archies. Yeah, that's weird. I, I was only, I'm only just yeah. learning about how many Archies there are. Yeah, this, this is like the grown-up version of Archie. So he's... I mean, but like he's the other Archie. Archie might he's be... He's still alive. Okay. <laughs> yeah. that's Archie bad. lives, Lucy. You can never no, throw right. off a Munchkin <laughs> property. Ever. That's why I don't. Like Eighteen Batman's. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why the girls were so obsessed with Archie though. Like he was really yeah. not. Yeah. No one knows. No one. Knows. Maybe no he one had a really good game. I don't know. But he clearly I, did. But like. I, guess I I can't see it, but uh. I don't really know what the other there's there's Jughead, but he clearly is just. Well, his has name is Jughead, so that's not really a lady killing situation. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Yes. <laughs> I think this is advantage of being written by a man. Yeah, <laughs> he's written by a sexist, so. <laughs> so the Archie thing is so weird. It's like they're trying to cram in so many ideas into a story. Like, I'm all for, like, political comics. Like, I'm all for, like, you know, any time, any any way you can inject politics into things. I, I think it's interesting, you know. It doesn't always work, and sometimes it comes across as preachy depending on what, Archie. you know, work of art it is. But, like, the, it, with the Archie thing, the more I kind of look into it, it does kind of seem... At least some of the themes in it are a bit preachy, but uh, I mean, that's, well, it's just combining a lot of things. Like, it, it's his gay friend who's a politician who's against guns, and then he gets shot, and like, uh, yeah, so it's like you got the anti-gun message. So but it's like Harvey the, Milk, what's his name, yeah, Brady, yeah. like... Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a lot of things mixed together, and it's like... <laughs> So is the adult? Very strange. Did they do like a you know feel about adult it. Archie reboot situation? Because that sounds yeah. like a really easy joke, but I guess they did. 
It's, I've seen the, like the panel before the fatal bullet is fired. It's all over the internet. And it's like it looks like they just like you know they like grabbed the picture of Jack Ruby and the picture of Reagan and they just like <laughs> like, let's just draw this together. And, you know. Oh, and uh, one more thing to add. It's He's also Archie. blind. Oh, no, uh, really? Yeah, he Wait, what's he's, that? He's black, gay, a politician against the Second Amendment. You know, maybe they're just wow. rolling conservatives <laughs> That's amazing. so much that it's actually genius. I think I've changed my mind. I mean, when was the last time it's anyone ever talked brilliant. about Archie? Ever in the history? Well, that's also true. That's all. I mean, Clever marketing move by Archie. Yeah. Just clever. Completely trolling all the conservatives in the world. All right, I still leave you Archie Comics. Well done. <laughs> but um, did did we discuss Lady Thor at all? Just a, that was where the breasts came. Uh, yeah, that's where you're you... mostly talking about her wonderful breasts. I mean, the, cool the design of the character looked awesome. I thought it looked awesome. It looks mm-hmm. like a Valkyrie. It's cool. Serious. Yeah. Like she looks serious. It's cool. Um, but, like that's the I... thing. Like when in comic book like storylines like this. Like, nothing is ever set in stone. Like, yes, it'll be a Lady Thor, and they'll figure out a way to do it, even though, you know, 70 other people have held the hammer and Mm -hmm. didn't become Thor or whatever. And then once, you know, they want to bring Thor back, they will. And it's just, you know... This is a genius, like, totally everything is possible in comic books, which, Mm -hmm. I I mean, mean, our Uncle John tweeted... What did he tweet, Joe? Did you see it? It was the something fe- about the, the feminization of America. Yeah. And it's yeah, about yeah. Lady Thor. I'm like, oh, what gives a what? shit, Uncle John? Good lord. Really? That is not the feminization of America that you're <laughs> talking about. Dude. He, he has a whole thing about that where. I can start a conversation about that, but it doesn't start with Lady Thor. <laughs> I didn't think it did. I didn't think it did. Like, all right. Unpleasant. I don't know. Like, it starts with about... cheese boxes. Like... <laughs> Indeed, it does. And the soy, soy milk. The soy milk. Oh, the soy. That estrogen. Mess you up. Like, overprotective parenting or arguable. All right, fine, Uncle John. We can talk about that. But Lady Thor. Oh, my God. I don't know. It was really weird. <laughs> and then he was like, the... like the Uncle John. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the feminization of American literature in response to my, like, taking issue with his tweet. And I was like, what is, the hell does that mean? Like, are, are ladies not allowed to have books? Stand- I don't know. No conservatives, man. They're super weird, even That's when they're related weird. to you. That's strange. Isn't that the worst having a conservative related to you? Well, except for liberals. Except for okay, conservatives. Yeah, That's true. It's hard. It, it's hard. It, I got into a bit of an argument with my dad last night over immigration, and it's like, oh, God, not this oh, conversation. Really? Yeah, in a Mexican restaurant, so it was, like, oh, no. really awkward. Okay. <laughs> and he's, like, really, he was kind of loud about it, too. So I had to, like, kind of, like, be louder than him. Like, no, I support everyone. Please, like, don't ruin my food. Like, they're like, oh, don't worry, we're from El Salvador. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. You know, they're Sweet. like, we don't, we're not actually from Mexico, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was actually being overjoyed that my, my, our dad is actually sort of, he has his conservative, like, knee-jerk moments, but there are plenty of libertarians, not even conservatives, who, like... My dad is legit on immigration, and he's like, maybe Israel needs to calm down sometimes. And yeah. I appreciate that, particularly in the what with the last few weeks of newsness, because that really doesn't seem to be things that the conservative-leaning folks are strong on. The, the yeah. Israel thing is unbelievable with them. But not to go away from comics too far. <laughs> Um, was that Joe? Was that a, Joe's totally not even paying attention? Joe, are you He's there? He's conservative blogs. Is he? No, I don't know. <laughs> the You're screen's frozen. Keeper. I don't know. I guess the, I, I feel like the comic. Are you kidding me with this? <laughs> yeah. Yay! Hang on. This, this is. <laughs> Okay, Adam, I swear Who's to you. Who's next? Is this like Survivor on Hangouts or something? Well, I'm knocking on wood over here. This is like becoming a bit of a horror movie situation, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Like, they're picking us off one by one. I'm the killer. <laughs> is it the NSA, though? Who is Probably. it? I'm not Probably the NSA. Away, so they must be using me to piggyback because I'm the one that's closest. <laughs> um, I'll try Actually, someone drove into the NSA the other day while drunk, but that was a whole... 
That's awesome. Exactly. On accident? Yeah, so there, there's an exit off the Baltimore-Washington uh, Parkway, and you can go up there. And Actually, my dad's uh, Iranian-American friend did that once. You can imagine the experience he Oh, had. sweet Jesus. Whoa. That's what I going to say. Um, because it's just like a random and kind of unlocked exit. But this guy got drunk and drove up there and <laughs> apparently saw the saw the, like the NSA security police coming, turned around, drove down the ramp, and then was going north on the southbound lane of the Baltimore-Washington uh, Parkway. So uh, you can imagine that he had a great time once they finally caught up with him. Oh, is he free? <laughs> I do not believe he is free. I wouldn't be surprised if he won't be free for a long time. Oh, Plot twist. God. Yeah. Plot twist, it was Rob Ford. It was almost certainly <laughs> Rob Ford. <laughs> Noted Iranian American Canadian yeah. Rob Ford. Joe Joe, your... we have we have a horror movie scenario here with the hangouts. Like I don't know what's happening with everyone. Uh, being uh, I angered the internet gods or something. They're angry. <laughs> All right. Maybe this router is messed up, but I still don't explain the general wrongness that's happening. You need to sacrifice an iPhone. I was about to say, did you did you make any sacrifices? <laughs> I did. I forgot to sacrifice before I came on. Squad, I've got the ammo, so you know. As long as one stagger wall's on, all time. It's a big thing in the Second Amendment. Like community is the shooting of the iPhone, which I've never really understood. There's like many many YouTube videos of iPhones being shot for some. Wait, time. really? Yes. That, why is that a thing? Oh yeah, well, some people. Uh, I I know that some people smashed their iPhones after the Apple Store stopped carrying the Bitcoin app. Wow, and they that's... just halted all Bitcoin apps, and it did cause. I don't know if this is the that's same incident. It may be something else, but I do know a bunch of Bitcoiners made videos uh, destroying their iPhones. We totally so, should talk about Bitcoin. How many of those? Well, two things. How many of those were? How many of those were filmed on an iPhone? And how many That's what I'm wondering. Regretted destroying that. <laughs> See, <laughs> like I could thing. never destroy a phone. Like I have all my old like dumb phones like in a stash just mm -hmm. in case you know something happens. It's like I could never even destroy a phone. Like it's like this is serious. But I mean, yeah, it could be that. It could be something else though. Yeah, but I just think it, I think if they just make in, on high speed cameras. The, the bullet passing through the phone makes a cool shot, so people like doing mm. that. I mean, that that would oh, be yeah. tempting if yeah, you had a lot of spare cool phones. Yeah. Poor Michelle, once I kicked her off, she could never return. Man. Yeah. You're not allowed back. The technical... I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know that would happen. I was hoping her technical difficulties would go away. The Internet gods hate us today. Michelle experienced Google Hangouts, an uh, extraordinary rendition. So. Uh, apparently so. Um, we haven't going for a while. So I, I'm gonna try to, I'm trying to regain, even though I feel like I lost my uh, throne of internetness <laughs> from being kicked off. You guys could have been talking about anything better. while I was gone. You could have been talking about how the government is awesome while I was gone, and I would never know. <laughs> so I watch it later. We were just talking about comic book boobs. Okay, well that's that's okay. Four. It's a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will I will wrap it up then. I will I will try to seize control. Um. We can do a quick round of what are you enjoying this week that's not politics, um, and what am I enjoying this week? Well, let's see. All right, I'll start. Yes. No, I won't start. Joe, you start. Um, I'm enjoying nothing because there's no sports tonight. The World Cup's over. What about Ninja Warrior, Joe? The greatest sport of our time. Eh, I'm over that. That was a couple of years ago. I'm I'm pretty happy for Germany though. I'm enjoying Germany's victory. And Ninja Warrior. It's the only sport I care about, Joe. No. <laughs> I don't know what other sport you could possibly be referring to. You're Ninja not a stagger wall. I agree. Um, thank you. I know. I've been, I was watching, I watched hours of Ninja Warrior when that uh, amazing woman kicked ass on the one course, and now the internet's excited, was excited about that today. First yes. woman or first American woman ever? So seen. amazing. I don't think anybody, any woman has ever been that good at it. They, yeah, she's first... never beaten a qualifying course that was like the same course as the men's course. I don't think that's ever happened in yeah. Ninja Warrior. Um, yeah. And it was really epic. But it was been... really epic. It was, wasn't it? Dude, kept... dude she's so badass. <laughs> I kept waiting for her to fall, and I was like, she's, she's done great. You know, if she falls, it's okay. And she just never fell. That was so good. Uh, Even like the she gets to like the very last thing and they're like still talking about like she's so little she the space is four feet tall and she's only five feet tall can she make it and she just like scurries up that thing like no problem like, through, yeah. why, and, like hits the like the button oh, it was badass uh, okay. y'all gotta watch it y'all gotta watch it yeah. feminists need to like feminists can all retire now because. <laughs> 
That's what I thought. Equal rights. You did it. Yeah. Like, no, no kind of patriarchy is holding her down. Like she's <laughs> got very this. true. Very true. Oh man, MK, you're here, and we can't. We aren't even talking about tedious libertarian infighting. What a, what a waste! Huh? What a waste! I've been enjoying our conversation so I know. far. So. I, I was kidding. It's, this, this is way better. I've than been me. enjoying the Weird Al videos. Oh my god! Have like, you? I haven't experienced so, them yet. You have to. You have to. That so like yeah. What a, what what is good news? Happy things for the week. Weird Al videos. I, I liked him. I listened to him a lot when I was a kid, and uh, we all who didn't who didn't yeah, yeah. yeah I know it was great <laughs> great stuff. And like now I don't listen to like pop music so much, so like I don't recognize some of the songs he's parodying, but they're still really funny. Like he makes really too, shitty actually. pop music. I'm old like now. yeah, <laughs> but it's like he he makes terrible pop music like bearable and fun, and I love it. So that's cool. And he's kind of he's doing a new video each day. From the new album, so on a different on a different media platform too, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, he's changing it Return up. So of, Return of Weird Al, that's good. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, I've just been listening to the new Old Crow album, which I kind of finally has clicked after more listens than usual, and I've been watching a lot of Twilight Zone and X Files, and not nice. um, yeah, and wanting to do that and not actually write anything because I'm in my all of my writing is terrible mode. Which is very boring. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of going through that. I know you feel. But you gotta rally because I'll ask you to promote once we're done with this thing. Uh, Adam, what have you been enjoying this week? Uh, I've been enjoying, politics? actually, I've been enjoying that mobilitywad.com. Uh, it's that all is. about fixing all of your various mobility issues because that's I get excited. To come I have those. Watch, <laughs> watch uh, videos about squatting and deadlift and uh, just generally being kind of a badass, and uh, so that's that's my thing. Right now. All right, that's good. I've been doing that, so check it out, mobilitywide.com. Uh, okay, that's good. We're good. Things that aren't politics, they'll never fail us. That's my favorite thing about them. Um, all right. I never really, all right, we're trailing off, and I lost my my something when I when the internet hated me. So I think we'll just wrap this up, and God only knows what it looks like. But I think Joe probably had a handle on things while I was gone. I didn't have a handle on things while he was gone. I was lost. Um, all right. If anyone wants to promote their works or, or say just something extra for fun, MK, tell the good people where they can read your stuff in the world. Uh, so I'm the editor of Bitcoin Not Bombs. I also write for Bitcoin Not Bombs. I have stuff on Bitcoin Magazine and Attack the System. And I also have a personal blog called Extremely In Between, and that just kind of has random articles, but a lot of the stuff I write is Bitcoin related, so, and you can find me on Twitter at MKLords. Actually, can you really quickly tell people about Bitcoin Not Bombs? Because we're here, and it's a good thing. Yes. Okay, so Bitcoin Not Bombs is a, uh, we, we're a non-government organization. We do a charity event every year called Hoodie the Homeless, where you can purchase a hoodie from us, and we will donate a hoodie to a homeless person. We do this in the wintertime, so what we do is we're accumulating donations now. You can also buy a t-shirt. Um, we have, like, uh, hoodies and t-shirts. If you buy, uh, you know, either one of those, it will donate that to a fund, and we'll, uh, in the wintertime, we hand out hoodies to homeless people, and also other things they need, food. Um, you know other other basic necessities. Um, so we do that. Uh, we also have uh, different blog posts every week. Uh, a lot of just uh, from op eds to uh, you know pro Bitcoin, even anti Bitcoin stuff is on there. So oh, that's um, funny. yeah, <laughs> we we have a Bitcoin hater um, as a writer. So uh, yeah, that's so really we try weird. to keep. <laughs> that's true diversity and ideological content. That's very good. I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and our focus is also on on you know anti-war aspects with uh, cryptocurrencies too. So uh, so yeah, check that out. Bitcoinnotbombs.com. Awesome. That is awesome. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add to the people? What are you doing with your life? Uh, I wrote a draft for the stag log and I plan yes. to publish it sometime next week. <laughs> All right, well, that's good. That's something. Adam, final words or self promotion? Uh, I'm currently working on a like uh, natural fitness and self reliance uh, project. I hope I can put together in the next like six to eight months. Um, so 
That's not. That's not. That's not a sound bitey enough. What are you doing with your life now? Tell I'm us. What am I doing with my life right now? I'm getting dirty, running into trees while trying to climb them and picking up rocks. That's and then I'm gonna I'm gonna write about that and hopefully I can help some other people enjoy those things too. That sounds okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, and you can read my things at rare and antiwar.com and vice and of course the stag blog. And I'm being monotone because I think it's all terrible right now. But I know it's not really. So you should go look at those things. Okay. I have no idea how long this took. We kept losing and gaining guests. But in spite of that, I think it was actually a really good conversation. And I think that our two shiny new guests did a really awesome job. So thank you to them for joining us, MK and Adam. Um, thanks to Joe for being here in my stead when the Internet was angry. And... Um, Poor sweet Michelle, I'm sorry that I accidentally kicked you out of the hangout when you are technical difficulties, and then inviting you back failed. <sighs> that was rough. But uh, all right, yeah, politics for people who hate politics. Thanks for uh, joining us there, audience, future audience. All right, bye.